日本語でも説明しますね。えー、Zoom にご参加の皆様にご案内です。発表前に Zoom の操作を練習します。えー、質疑でその Zoom の挙手の機能を使用します。ズームの画面の下の方に参加者のアイコンというものがございますので、そちらをクリックすると挙手が出てきます。操作になれるために挙手をしてみてください大丈夫そうですかね。と二名の方が、えー、挙手の機能を実際ご利用いただいていますので、では時間の関係上次の方に進めさせていただきます。えー、えー、えー、とお試しいただいた皆様ありがとうございます。では手の方を下ろしていただいて、えー、Thank you very much. Please put your hand down. えー、続いてお知らせです。えーえー、you can write your question and thoughts in the Zoom chat during the talk. トーク中は、Zoom のチャットに質問や感想を書いてもらっても大丈夫です。続いて、えー、This is the announcement for attendees from YouTube Live. The hashtag for this room is p y c o n j p n u m b e r 4 Please feel free to tweet your thoughts and observation with the hashtag. YouTube で見ている方にご連絡です。この部屋のハッシュタグは PyConJP の、えー、ナンバー4です、えー。感想や気づきなど、ぜひハッシュタグをつけてツイートしてみてください。でそれではこれから、ジャミさんの手を始めます、えー。Now we are going to start Gavin's presentation. The title is I can't believe it's still here.、Uh, the presentation time is 30 minutes, including questions and answers.、Uh, before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for a microphone test. Gavin, okay?、Uh, please read the paper for a microphone test. Yeah, sure.、Um... So, hi everyone, my name is Gavin. The title of my presentation is I Can't Believe It's Still Here. My presentation will be in English. My presentation materials are in English. I will publish the presentation materials. I agree to having my picture taken during my presentation. I will compile with the PyCon JP Code of Conduct. Thank you, Gavin.、Uh, please share your screen. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes, okay.、Uh, yeah. Please welcome Mr. Gavin with applause. Thank you, thank you, everyone.、Um, my name is Gavin. Today, I'm going to talk about、uh, deprecating your functions in your source code. I believe you guys must have faced a situation that、uh, you first join a new project or existing project that you haven't been working before.、Uh, the source code has been there for a while, and you spotted some functions or features you're not sure whether they're still in use by external users. Um, you don't know what to do.、Uh, it seems t h e r e s no value to keep、uh, those deprecating codes over there, but there's also no value to remove them. So you keep it over there until the next maintainer h a v e the same questions again. So today I'm going to talk about how the deck code sometimes, when suddenly it came alive,、uh, it may hurt your applications, it may hurt your users, and 
may be the worst case, it may hurt your company. So first of all, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm now working in ASA, I am Corist, uh, which is a quantitative asset management firm uh, as a quant developer. Uh, Python is currently my major language. Uh, I also have some uh, personal open source projects in Python as well. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can have a look into it. Uh, I have been in the um, software development industry in finance for it's my nine years already. Uh, before I work as a um, C++ developer, my previous firm was a uh, software vendor which provide the trading solutions to customers. So it has been in for more than 20 years already. So when I first joined a company, I, I have a look on the 20 years lines, uh, which is like billions or trillion lines of code. And of course, there are some functions or features that are actually not used. So it came to my questions, what can I do for that? And then the following story catch my eyes. So it's, it's Gavin, an incident. Sorry, yep. interrupt. Sorry. Uh, to, could you turn on your video? Oh, could you turn on your video camera? Yes. So we want to uh, streaming this session. Uh, your slide and your video camera. Oh, you thank see? you, thank you. And uh, in, in this state, please share your screen. Can see both? Oh, これは、um, I see, I see. Uh, in your screen sharing, your camera is turned turn off. So this is zoom spec. It seems this is zoom spec. So Please go ahead. Please go ahead in this. Thing. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Maybe 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 after the uh, presentation, I just I just stop the uh, screen sharing, and then you guys will see my face again. <laughs> um, so that that come it came to the um uh, the story of um the night capital. A single tanker incident happened in two thousand twelve, but um it just happened for thirty minutes. But completely blew up the whole company. Um, Nine Capital was one of the largest trader in U.S. stocks. Um, what it did was a market making in the U.S. public exchanges, and um, a single telecode issue just cost them 40, 40 million U.S. dollar, uh, roughly, which is three percent of their annual revenue, or which is roughly four times or four years of their net income. And um, I would like to go through a little bit details of it so that we can learn the lesson from it and so as to, uh, to go through what are the good practices that we can do with the deprecating code or the, uh, the, the debt reduction. So the background of the event was um, Night Capitals, the major revenue driver was on the public exchange. So they compete not only with other market makers but also on the financial services, providing the private markets or the dark pools. Um, for example, the Goldman Sachs, the UBS, uh, they all have the dark pools for the institu institutional investors. Um, since 2008, so the dark pool closed the, um, the volume from 15%, 4%. So Nine Capital feel that um, the revenue bleeding out due to the dark pool. And what's worse was in 2011, a New York Stock Exchange proposed their own version of that pool, which is called the Retail Integrity Program, uh, in short, which is uh, our LP. After they received the SEC approval in end of June in uh, 2011, uh, which is 2012, it quickly announced the LP went live uh, uh, on 1st of August. And Nine Capital has no other choice. They have to participate in the program. Uh, otherwise, they just keep seeing their revenue bleeding out. It was a worse news for the software development team because uh, they have to make the changes in 30 days. It was a very tight deadline. I think for most developers agree that if they have to catch a schedule for a month and go and live and ensure that everything is all fine, it's night playing toes in the corns. So they have to make the changes on the existing trading system, which is called the Smart Market Access Routing System. 
Uh, what it does for Mars is a direct parents order the downstream execution between dozens of different trading values. So it means when they receive the parents order, for example, they would like to buy 10,000 shares, then they will check uh, all the public exchanges or the dark pools and then find out the best price or best liquidity that they should route the orders to. So the RMP code is like a new features on the existing system. So I guess it's due, due to the tight deadline, they just replace some of the used code uh, or the deprecating code uh, by the RMP code. Uh, it contains a all the algorithm which is called Power Patch. So Power Patch was just to buy high and sell low. So it means if you just place in the in the production market, then most of the time it's just losing money. So it is used only in testing environment, not in use in live trading environment, um, and. And after incident, the audit report is saying that uh, actually it was a dead group for several years already. So somehow it looks to be smart that the development team just replaced the existing code by the RIP code and they repurposed the flat. So if you turn to yes, previously it means to turn on power patch. But after they replace it, it means to activate the RIP functionality. So it seems to be perfect, but uh, they didn't take the human errors into account. So a week before going live, uh, which is end of uh, July in 2012, so an engineer manually deployed in the RIP codes uh, to the training system, but only to seven out of 10 production servers. So he missed one. Neither a senior engineer spotted out, nor uh, it was a notified the system. So a week before, even though he deployed, the fact turned to no. So everything running seems to be all fine. But when it went to position and it turned to yes, which is, which is on 1st of August, when it turned to yes, uh, in the morning before market opened at 9.30, it, it had been the nurse sending out to the night personal emails, but it wasn't treated as um, the high priority nurse, nor reviewed it, uh, uh, in real life uh, by the staff. Uh, when market was opened, the RP orders was routed uh, to, this, to the old AVE servers, and the AVE server, which didn't uh, correctly deploy with the RP code, turned on with the power patch, started to continuously send in the trial orders. So even though the trial orders execute and match the requested orders from the parent's order, they just need that and keep sending out. So four minutes after the new stock exchange noticed a double trading volume originated by Knight Capital. So they alert, first they alert CEO, the CEO was on leave and then they alert the CIO. And CIO gather all the um, staff, uh, especially senior staff in the firm to find the reasons. But before they found the root cause of it, they couldn't flip the queue switch. So they have to keep the server running. So it lasts for around close to 30 minutes, they spot the spot recalls and they had to shut it down. But this short 30 minutes has caused so much for the firm. So the consequence was to execute 400 million of shares and they produced the net on position on some stocks for 3.5 million and another set of net short positions, uh, which is 3.15 billion on other sources. Uh, it is the worst case for a market makers firm because they would like to have the market neutral positions. Um, they couldn't cancel it. They couldn't cancel the trade uh, from SEC because uh, for me, it makes sense because every day there must be some market participant uh, making mistakes. So um, it doesn't justify to cancel the, uh, the bogus trades. So they have to settle the net positions. They have to face the 440 million losses, uh, but they didn't have enough cash they have to receive the cash infusion from investors. And if to keep the firm running, the only way they can do it is they just, they just sold the company to another rival, which is called GetCode and combined as KCU groups. So it seems to be horrible that a single accident uh, caused so much for a firm. So if, if we think back the lesson that we can learn, first of all, uh, note many deployment because nowadays everyone embraced the continuous integration continuous deployment system 
it's not a problem though. And if you think back, which is 10 years ago, um, for example, the firm Knight Capital, they have their co-located servers um, in different exchanges or different vendors. 10 years ago, continuous deployment is not something, a common practice for the firms. So somehow for me, it, it makes sense. They didn't have it and they have to face the consequence. But something that we can control as a developer is actually we can keep ensure that uh, there's no deprecating code or then no that code remained in the code base. So as to keep the, uh, the, the source code base to be clean. But what the Ninja way to do that? First of all, um, I think most teams embrace the agile uh, methodology now. So I would suggest devote the time for that reduction and refactoring. It doesn't mean that uh, it's, it is used to clean the deck code, but it can be also means to reveal the complexity of the software and try to refactor it a little bit and see what are the assumptions behind are they all valid. So you're not doing all at once in the big band, but you have to pay the patience and do it bit by bit, like 10% or 12% every spin. Developers normally hesitate to, um, to clean the deck code because they feel dumped if they remove it and a week later they will request to get it back. And, um, and it's sometimes not easy to find out all the history to understand uh, which, uh, which commit uh, have removed such changes. So if you use the version control smartly, then you may have more confidence and feel more comfortable in removing the code. For example, if you use git diff with the keywords, you can find out all the commit changes, uh, which including the, the keywords change. And normally human memory is highly dependent to time. So you may recall which time period you moved the function, but did not recall exactly what's the name. You can also use a git not with the time range to find out the possible commits. And also you can pass your auth name, likely to be yourself, to restrain the number of commits. All this more about the fundamentals. Uh, you, you just uh, have the automated testing, including unit testing, regression testing, and uh, always have the testing back behind to support your development. It will help uh, reducing the effort for you to remove the dead code. So um, after removing that code, you can just simply run the testing to ensure that there's nothing broken on the existing functionality. Test automation means integrating all your testings before you release and deploy your software. So it may involve the uh, common practice of continuous integration and continuous deployment. And testing not only means the testing in your software, but also on the downstream process. Other libraries or applications may rely on software. In the whole development team, if they all set up with all those infrastructure, then even though you remove the functions, they still will know that those be called before deploying or released. We also can uh, refer to some of the libraries, the common libraries to see what are the ways or the good practice to tell the users to let the users know you're going to deprecate or migrating some of the features. Um, the key is communications. So you just take up the, all the possible communication channel to the users to alert them what you will do. Um, for example, documentations like in Django, they have a page to set up the deprecation timeline as number uh, to tell the users that which function and which version they will be removed. So everything written explicitly and you expect the users to look into the ofi official documentations to understand uh, when the bummer versions, what may be broken up. And also test automations, try to educate your users and downstream processes to understand that test automations will help capture the deprecation warnings that you raise out. So for example, just let them know uh, the Python warnings switch to always it will always cap, capture the, the deprecation warnings that we not raised. And of course, they also capture other deprecation warnings when the latest nice and we will go for little bit details how we can do that. Uh, for NumPy and second learned, uh, they have the YouTube functions uh, to, to decorate the function.string so that 
uh, when they deployed the documentations, when they released the latest documentations, if the functions has has put the decorator onto it to mention as that de uh, deprecating function that in doctrine, uh, the users can see, okay, these functions will be removed in a particular version. Finally, if you are a very core libraries, we believe that if you have breaking some changes or you are going to move to a big band changes that may annoy, but um, you that may annoy the users, but you can't wait for all the users to migrate their features or their API calls. And the other way to work around with that is like TensorFlow. Uh, I think it's, it's a rare case, you, you need to do that, but if you ensure that your library as, is as important as TensorFlow, <laughs> then you can do it in this way. So you just add a compatibility API. So when TensorFlow released the V2 versions, you just copy all the existing source code to a compatibility module in V1. And then they keep all the, all the API changes, all the new features in the existing module. And also the, they referenced uh, the source code by the compatibility module V2. So the users can switch between V1 and V2, even though they upgrade the V2. And then I would suggest that there are three stages that you can approach uh, when you're going to deprecate the functions. Um, as we learned from, from other open source libraries, communication is the key. So documentation and enhancement proposal will help you to alert the users about your deprecation plan. And also version is a uh, versioning of your library is a important key for the users that uh, how they should handle it uh, when you upgrade your versions. So please, when you release your software, please always align with semantic versioning. So semantic version of V2 uh, is a guideline for the development team on how to bump up the versions of your library. So for example, if you bump up the major versions, uh, which is from 1.0.0 to 2.0.0, then a major version change means you're going to make incompatibility API changes. Then when the users saw, when the users see that you're bumping up the major versions, they know that they they have to reserve some more time to check when they bump up the dependency, which is your your library, and they have to check whether something broken. But if you uh, just bump up the minor versions and ensure that you're not breaking the API, you're not breaking the function prototype. If you follow all of that, the users are always happy and they understand when they bump up major versions, they have to reserve time to, to check whether something broken on their side. Uh, smartly use the deprecation warning. Uh, but deprecation warning sometimes it's, it's not fancy to use because uh, by default, it just hidden on the downstream process. Uh, after the PIP uh, uh, 565, which is uh, implemented in Python 3.7, then if you call by the double underscore main double underscore, which is your entry point, then all the deprecation warning will be shown. But if your library is like NumPy, Pandas, uh, you have no entry point. So the, uh, the downstream process decide entry points then, that is most likely will be missing. So you have to suggest the users always show the deprecation warning when they run the testing. So when they run the PyTest by default, uh, if there's a warning throw out, uh, it, will, it will show it as warning in yellow color in PyTest, uh, but most likely will be missed in the continuous integration system. But if they switch, always switch the thread, dash W error, uh, double colon deprecation warning, the deprecation warning return to be error, and the PyTest will catch it, it will stop the continu continuous integration, and it's the way that the user need to check back in the libraries and see what are the features uh, relying on your deprecating versions. Uh, of course, turning on the deprecation warning may be annoying because our libraries also share the same thing to do. You can invent your own deprecation warning so that uh, you ask the users to put dash out error and then with your deprecation warning class so that it will catch only your library's warning. After you warn the users, 
you plan to remove it, but I would suggest to separate two stages. One is one's called expire stage. So expire stage just throw out exceptions so as to alert the users um, uh, when, when the function is called, it just hit the exceptions. But you provide other procedures for users to break around for the expired stage. After that, uh, you just clean up uh, the, the deprecation part from source code. Normally, people just combine them together and then clean it directly. But I would suggest if you would like to make your user feel comfortable, then you just provide procedure for them. If they really hit for that and they have no time buffer, they can still have some broken around in between. Then um, I will introduce uh, my person library, which is called Auto Deprecator, uh, which will help to uh, go through all the stages and help you guys help the development team uh, to implement to deprecating what the, the functions uh, in every stage. So basically, it's very simple. It's just a decorator. So auto deprecate in, include the decorator, which is called deprecate. Then if you put on top of the functions, you provide your library versions, which is like the dynamic one. You provide your expired versions. Then by default, you will just throw out exceptions. Sorry, by default, you throw out the uh, deprecation warning when it is in the warning stage. Also you could suggest more about um, what are the relocate functions, what the functions you, you migrate to, and also you can customize a little bit, not only throwing out deprecation warnings, but also on other ways like not gained or your own team practice uh, warning system. So you can customize a little bit with the, with the decorator. After the warning stage, when it goes to expire stage, for example, you have released the 2.0.0, then when the user call it, call your deprecator functions, then they will hit exceptions. So which is saying that runtime error, uh, the function has been deprecated in version 2.0.0. But then the user saw the missing functions, they saw the explicit message uh, why the functions should be removed. And it's a rare case, but the user may call you back and complain, come on, I have no time. I didn't, didn't aware, I wasn't aware that you have uh, the deprecation plan before. And it's in the position, it's hitting my system. I can't spend the time to change the functions to another. Then you can ask your user, just a work around in the position system. Then they just pass in deprecation versions with the previous version, so as to get around with the exceptions. The same case, it means you can test with the expired stage, even though the future version is not yet released. So for example, you just released the 1.9.0, uh, there's functions will be deprecated in 2.0. Then you can ask the downstream processors and ask other teams to test uh, what if we release the 2.0? Does it impact your software? Then the, um, the downstream processors just turn on the thread, uh, deprecate versions to future version. If they hit the exceptions, it means, okay, there's some features still relying on it. Then they can spend some development time to, to remove it. Finally, cleaning stage. I understand that for developers, it's a very boring process to clean the source code and to find out every piece of functions to check whether they're expired or not. So the auto deprecate project provides a command line, which is called auto deprecate. And if you pass the source code on the directory of the source codes, it just look up it recursively. And then you provide the versions, most likely coming out from the Git tag or the, uh, the Git describe then it will check for every piece of code if there exists the decorator and whether uh, the, the expired versions has been stripped over, uh, has been has been stripped over the current version already. If so, they just remove it. And they also remove the redundant import of the deprecate. So it will have a nice piece of code after running that auto deprecate. Uh, if your team embraced uh, your, your team practice to uh, remove or to alert users for deprecations and you're not using the decorator, uh, the other way you can do it is you just, you just put uh, the command line. So you just put hash, auto deprecate, and then provide expired versions. Then auto deprecate uh, command line will also check whether this command line happens uh, in, the, in the function as well. If so, they will remove it. And finally, if you're interested in the project, uh, please don't hesitate to go to my uh, GitHub project page to have a look on the features. 
If you have any questions, any new ideas, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, my LinkedIn name is Kevin Chan. So um, that's all for my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. We have a few minutes for a question. If you have any questions for Mr. Gavin, please click the raise ha raising hand button in Zoom. Eh, 発表ありがとうございました。それでは質問の時間を設けます。えー、ギャビンさんに質問のある方はいらっしゃいますか、えー、?Zoom の機能で挙手をお願いします。少々お待ちください。Announce again.、Uh, yes. We have a few minutes for a question. If、uh, for attendees,、uh, we have a few minutes for a question. If you have any questions for Mr. Gavin, please click the raising hand button in Zoom. Sorry, just a moment, please.、Mm -hmm. Wait, just a moment, please. So I guess, I guess there's no more questions, but、uh, finally, a few parting words. I guess now is an unusual moment for everyone that we have to go through the conference in online sessions. So I really wish everyone a good health and good luck. Stay, really stay, safe, stay safe at home. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, the time is up. We will end Mr. Gavin's talk.、Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Gavin. Thank you.、Uh, everybody, thank you, everybody, please give a big round of applause to the speaker. Thank you. Hope to see you、uh, all in phase in next year. <laughs>